Hey, everyone. Welcome to the 200th episode of the Neurodiversity Podcast. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and I am joined today by my friend, Amanda Morin. So, Amanda, thank you for making the time to chat with me today. Absolutely. Happy 200th episode. Thank you. So, um, for those of you who don't know, Amanda has been on the show a few times in the past. We also co-authored a book together, which will be out next fall. It is about creating neurodiversity-affirming schools. It was a project that we both loved and hated the entire way through, but we're really excited for it to be out there. (laughs) Absolutely. A labor of love, and we can't wait for people to read it. And what we're going to talk about today for our 200th episode is about gratitude, as it is Thanksgiving in the U.S. this week. And we thought maybe we would try to tie that in because I think in a lot of ways, being neurodivergent and talking about neurodiversity and being part of the neurodiversity community in general, there are a lot of things to be grateful for. And I just thought we would maybe have a conversation about that and kind of explore what that means for us and maybe allow other people the space to kind of reflect on that in their own lives as well. Interestingly enough, it's the neurodiversity movement that brought us together as friends, right? that brought us together as co-authors. Like, So I'm incredibly grateful for that. Because now I have this amazing friend and compatriot and yeah. confidant and all of these things. So that's wonderful. I would say that sense of community, I, I agree with. I mean, in addition to just the friends that I've developed through this community, just recognizing and having people who are kind of part of a common cause has been has been really powerful and feel like being a part of something that's making a difference in people's lives. And also, I think just that feeling of not having to explain yourself Mm. is so powerful to me to be a part of a community where I can show up and truly be myself and not have to backtrack and explain who I am and why I think that way or any of those kinds of things has been really like a gift to me. So I thought maybe one of the things we could talk about a little bit Um, just as far as some of the changes that have occurred over the years, is that we both actually started our careers as educators. And part of the reason I went into education was because I was neurodivergent, more than anything, because school had been so difficult for me. And I will even say that teaching as a general education classroom was also really hard for me because Um, I didn't really have the executive functioning skills. I mean, I was also young. I started teaching when I was 21 years old. Me too. Who thought that was a good idea? I don't know. Speaking of neurodivergence, I'm going off on a tangent here for a minute. Yeah. I had a parent of one of my students, I was teaching kindergarten my first year, ask to see my driver's license to make sure I was old enough to be a teacher. Oh my gosh. Which makes me think, I must have looked pretty young and I really was. So The very first night of the open house night? Um, as parents and kids are walking in and the first child walked in and I introduced myself and I introduced myself as Emily as opposed to Miss Kircher because <laughs> I just wasn't used to it. And the parents looked at me and they said, do you want them to call you Emily? And I was like, oh, no. Um, Miss Emily. Um. <laughs> it was interesting, but being yeah. young and doing that. But I think also having that experience in the schools and even though it was really a struggle that year, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about students, but it also led me to the next stage of my career, which was working in gifted ed, which obviously I had a lot of neurodivergent students. I mean, just being gifted in and of itself is a type of neurodivergence, but also I had a lot of twice exceptional students, even though we weren't even really calling them that at that time. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but twice exceptional was not even really a term that was being used at that time. And I think I probably started teaching a little bit before you did, and it wasn't even on the radar. It wasn't on the radar at all. Mm -hmm. I think I probably got into teaching, too, because of my experience in school, where I felt sort of off balance my entire school career, right? And then I, but I loved teaching. I loved being around kids. I loved being around, you know, learners and watching people, like, get that aha moment, But I always felt, I'm going to be honest, like I felt a little out of sync with the other teachers Mm -hmm. when I was teaching. I never quite got the, I don't know, it's not like the social cues. I never quite got the culture. Mm -hmm. And that was hard for me. And I think it drew me to the students who felt that way too. And it brought me to the part of my career where I was working in early intervention with students who needed extra support. So I, I, you know, it's, it's both something that... 
I don't know. I think it's like we brought to our students the kind of teachers that we needed when we were students. Yeah. And that really was my purpose. I, I feel like, you know, when you can take some of those experiences and then try to help others or, or grow, I feel like that it gives meaning to some of those struggles as opposed to just feeling like it's random. I know one of the things that I'm so grateful for now when I look back on my education career is the fact that I can really verbalize and explain why behavior charts are not <laughs> worthwhile. And I know my first year teaching, everyone in the school had little cards that the kids would flip based on their, you know, what color day they were having and how they were behaving. And I hated it. And it felt gross to me. And I knew that I hadn't liked that when I was a student. And I knew that I didn't feel like it was even helping. But also I I did it just because that was the way it was done. And and yeah. You do better when you know better. And and you know, having those experiences though and looking back and realizing like there's been so much growth and understanding, even when we still have so far to go. Well, even just the fact that the word neurodiversity means something to people in schools right now is something to be really grateful for. I'm grateful that that we've come that far because, you know, my own children are neurodivergent. And it was it has become easier over time as they've been in school to talk about those those traits because people are starting to understand what that means. They're starting to understand that it's not just quirky. It's not just a little different, that there's actually something about the way their brains are interacting and taking in information that has scientific basis behind it. And I, I'm really grateful that over time, they've had a different experience than I have. Um, also, I think probably, I don't know about you, but being neurodivergent has made me a better parent to neurodivergent kids because I understand some of the struggles. I will say that, you know, they are different for all of us, so I don't understand them exactly. And sometimes they get in each other's way. Um, mm -hmm. You and I have had that as friends. Like there are things that, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> then, I, I mean, I just think that's kind of funny, but it's it's yeah. it's it's something to be thankful for is that you can recognize that that's actually a truth, yeah. right? I feel like we should give people some context <laughs> for what we're giggling about here, probably. Which is Amanda and I, when we were co-writing this book, um, we had a little writers' retreat. We kind of locked ourselves into an Airbnb for a weekend, which was weird because we had actually never even met in person before. I know. That. and so. Um, but we just felt like we knew each other well enough and that would be okay. But um, as we were working, I was sitting and I could see out the window <laughs> and there was construction that was happening out on the street. And so I was narrating this for Amanda because I was interested. Kind of, I don't know that I was really that interested, but it was catching my attention. And I was like, oh, look, now they're going to, I guess they're going to go for lunch because they're covering everything up, but they can't be done yet for the day. And I think Amanda was trying to focus. <laughs> I was trying to focus. I did appreciate your narration skills because they were very detailed. <laughs> but I do think at one point I said, I really need that to be an internal dialogue. <laughs> I don't know that you said that or if you said that I tuned it out. <laughs> Maybe I thought it really loudly. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it was um, I also thought it was all just rather amusing. <laughs> We're, we got work done. It was fine. I mean, there's a book in press. So like, yes, yeah. of course we did. It's funny because those are the kinds of stories that maybe don't make sense to people who are not part of this community. Like, they may not yeah. understand why, like you really were focused on it. It caught your eye mm -hmm. and, and your brain was just sort of there. And I bounce back and forth a lot, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. so I can look at that and then go back to what I was doing because that's just kind of how my my brain works. And so, but it catches my eye and I have to kind of assess and see what it is. But, you know, talking about being a parent, I, I will admit that there are times when I feel like we're okay with calling different types of neurodivergence disabilities, you know, and, and recognizing that there are hard parts of those, but knowing also that they come along with strengths as well. And so as a parent, I know there are times like talking about those different needs, I am super sensitive to just sounds in general that are really 
bothersome and irritating to me. And if I'm already stressed, it's really hard for me to recognize that. I will say the benefit, though, to that and knowing that I'm neurodivergent is that I understand that frustration that I experience. And I try to kind of handle it on my own as opposed to getting onto the kids about being <laughs> noisy or whatever it is that they're doing. That's so interesting. You know, so if it means that I have to ex excuse myself from a space or whatever, um, I try to do that. But it's, you know, it's kind of a both and situation. That's so interesting. We do that in our house, too. And it's interesting because I'm very much the same way with sounds. When I'm stressed, they're more, it's like I can hear everything. I feel like I have supersonic hearing when I'm very stressed. But it's funny because now that, you know, two of my kids are chronologically adults. And so <laughs> now they kind of put that back on me where it's like, well, you're making this noise that's bothering me. And I'm just like, oh, okay. But then we also sort of joke about it in our house. My my husband, also neurodivergent. I mean, it's just the whole household, right? Right. There are days where I'm saying to him, could you just could you just stop breathing? <laughs> but he knows I mean like loudly, like, I, you know, but he's not actually breathing loudly. So he's delightful enough to be like, I'll just move. <laughs> but it becomes shorthand in our house. And I, and I think probably a lot of homes like ours end up having these kind of shorthand things that outside of our home probably don't sound the same way they sound inside our home. Yeah. Even when those needs are at odds. I mean, my daughter Maggie is um, an eighth grader, but she is, she is the one who is like the constant movement, the constant need sensory seeking, needing that stimulation. Um, and you know, that that's for other people then who are sensory avoidant, that's kind of, it's a hard balance to strike. Obviously as the adult, I tried to try to be the one to uh, not try to ask her to mask, but at least I have the language as well. Like, I understand why she's doing this. And asking her to mask is not necessarily a helpful thing for her, either in the moment or in the long run. And so how do we find that balance in this environment? How do we have that conversation? Um, as opposed to what I think parents used to do, which was discipline their kids yeah. for these things. I think that's right. You know, it's interesting. I think there are plenty of times in my parenting career where I've had to stop and think and actually like I have said, stop doing that or no or whatever. And then I've actually taken a step back and said, actually, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You got to do what you've got to do. Or there's no reason I said no other than because it bothers me. You know, those kinds of things that I'm more aware of, I think, um, because as I get more aware of my own needs and my own, what it looks like when I don't mask. And I think that's something that I would say I'm thankful for the entire neuro neurodiversity movement for mm -hmm. is that even as I get older, I get better at being myself because there are more people mm -hmm. in the world who accept that. I wanted to talk a little bit about that self-acceptance piece. I share this story when I um, do talks and different things when I do trainings. But, um, you know, I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was a kid and started on medication. This was actually before Asperger's was even in the DSM. So I was never assessed for autism when I was a kid. But I know, I feel pretty confident that, well, if I were a child today and we were assessing, we would have really looked at that pretty strongly. Because I know, especially as I reflect back on my childhood, there were a lot of those things that really strongly aligned with that. But my point with this actually is that I started on medication for the ADHD. And I took medication really till I was about in high school. And then finally I stopped. Um, and my mom was kind of like, she threw up her hands. She's like, whatever, Emily, figure it out on your own. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then I went another 10 to 15 years treating myself for anxiety and depression because I was always so stressed and overwhelmed and really anxious about things. And then when my son, who's now 15, was diagnosed with ADHD and he started on medication when he was in second grade, I went back to my doctor and I was like, you know, I had this diagnosis as a kid. What do you think? And I started taking medication and it was amazing. My anxiety went away. But so much of that was all about the stigma and the internalized ableism 
I think I've told you this before, Amanda, but my my junior year term paper was titled ADHD, The Excuse of the 90s. You did tell me that. I remember that. And yeah. so finally getting to a point where I don't feel like those are things that should be um, I should be ashamed of or that are character flaws. There, there are still things that I'm working on. There are things that I'm realizing I need some accommodations or some supports or some other tools. Like there, And there are times I get frustrated when I struggle with something, but also like I don't blame myself for it in the same way. You're actually really good at sort of making it humorous. <laughs> I've, I've noticed that over time. You know, we've had a couple of meetings where I'm like, ah, could you just send me like the link for the meeting invite? And you're like, oh, yeah. I was getting to it, you know, and I actually, I think that's, that's one of the things I like most about you is you just sort of accept it as part of who you are. And I think that's Mm -hmm. really extraordinary. I will say I'm much like you, but I think if I were a kid today, I would not have all of the various diagnoses I had. I think that they would be autism, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I vacillate between whether or not I should go get diagnosed as an adult. I don't know what the value would be, but I don't know what the value wouldn't be, right? That kind of a thing. But I just read a book. I'm going to, you know, I just read a book by Fern Brady called Strong Female Character. And Fern Brady is a Scottish comedian. And this book, Strong Female Character, she talks about being diagnosed late in, late in life for her. I mean, and as she's telling the story of who she was and how she was as a child, I just recognized so much of myself in it in ways that I hadn't ever thought about. And it was an extraordinary experience to sort of back up that feeling of like, okay, wait, there were signs when I was a kid, but we didn't know. We didn't know. Right. And I don't know. I don't know why I'm telling the story. I think just because it's so fresh and recent for me having read this book. But I think also talking about that self-acceptance piece Part of the shift in how society is seeing and talking about these things is then providing those opportunities for people to self-reflect. Like that book wouldn't have been written, perhaps, or at least written in that way right? if society hadn't started to move how it was viewing neurodivergence in general. I also think I will be really honest in saying, so I'm I'm in a career transition at the moment, mm. and one of the things that I'm realizing is I'm a really good entrepreneur. I'm I'm really good at it. I'm a really good consultant. I'm really good at sort of stepping in and and doing talks and doing trainings and building teams and those kinds of things. And I think that that's one of the things I'm most grateful for as a neurodivergent human because I really think that the way my brain works has given me that ability to be an entrepreneur and do multiple Mm -hmm. things and be really good at multiple kinds of things because my brain works very quickly and in lots of directions at the same time. And I didn't realize until fairly recently that that's kind of a gift. Mm -hmm. It's not something that everybody is able to do. And I think that that's the piece that is interesting to me is realizing that oh, these are things that not everybody knows how to do, or this is not something everybody experiences. It's like a whole new theory of mind experience as an adult, realizing not just like other people have their own thoughts and their own you know, motivations and all those things, but other people don't always think the same way. It's just been a really, I don't know, eye-opening for me mm-hmm. to realize that those are things that I would not be if I weren't who I am, mm-hmm. you know, I, yeah. I, I don't... well, and recognizing that there's value to looking at those problems in different ways and that and that it is different than how other people look at it. You know, it, it's interesting you talk about being in, in this transition place. I was thinking about how so many neurodivergent people end up as entrepreneurs. There's a big proportion. There's kind of research. I can't cite anything, but people can go Google it if they're <laughs> if they're curious. But but I often t- think about how. Sometimes people will say, oh, so-and-so, yeah, they um, they outgrew ADHD. They used to be ADHD, but now they're not anymore, you know, because they they grew out of it. And I'm like, well, did they grow out of it or did they just graduate high school and get into a job 
<laughs> that actually used their strengths as opposed to being forced to be that square peg fitting in the round hole. And I think, I guess, being grateful for being having the opportunity to be an entrepreneur and to kind of figure out, like, this is what works best for me. I don't always fit, you know, really well in these other types of organizations where there's these particular roles that maybe don't exactly fit what my strengths are. But if I can create my own, I can be really successful. And there's a word for that. It's called job crafting. Mm. Like there's there's actually an entire, again, Google it because I yeah. can't cite the research either. But <laughs> but it's it's an interesting concept. Those transition times are a good opportunity for that self-reflection and figuring out what does work and where your strengths are. I, and I feel like a lot of people don't always have that opportunity. I think that's true. I think that's true. And um, it's really interesting that you say, you know, did they grow out of ADHD or did they just graduate and find mm. what their strengths are and how to, to play into them? I, when I go out and speak, one of the things, you know, people will often say like, wow, you've overcome so much, right? Mm. And I've started incorporating into my conversations before I even get there is the fact that the biggest part I want people to understand about being successful and being neurodivergent is that I haven't overcome anything. I've become something, right? Mm. Because of who I am, I've become who I am. And it's not that I've overcome anything to become who I am. And that's, I just, if, if there's anything to be grateful for that I want other people to like think about is that is, you know, what are you becoming because of the way your brain works. How have you integrated those parts of yourself to be whole as opposed to being separate from those diagnoses, which is kind of talks about some of the language shifts with identity first versus person first and, um, you know, all of those pieces. But I think there's really a an important component of that identity that we can really embrace that is something to be to be grateful for that has changed so much over the last five years. And I think I will just say too, that I'm fairly aware that not everybody's grateful yet, right? They haven't gotten to that place. Yeah. And that's okay too, right? And I just, I think I say it out loud because I know so many people are really struggling mm -hmm. to figure out where do they fit in the world, where do they fit in the community. And I, I just want to acknowledge that it's okay. If you're not thankful yet, or if you may not get there, that's okay too. Yeah. But we're thankful for them, for everybody. <laughs> you know, we're thankful. Yeah. We know that the supports aren't there for a lot of people. And even when you and I, from a place of relative privilege, can see the systemic changes and be grateful for those, that doesn't mean that everybody's feeling them. And so I agree that it's important to kind of keep that in mind. I mean, it's one of the reasons we do what we do, right? Is because we have that privilege to be able to see it and to call it out and to talk about it mm -hmm. and to help people feel more confident doing that themselves. The only thing I'll add there too is that we mentioned the word disability earlier in this conversation, but I don't think either of us consider neurodivergence like a superpower. Like I think that using euphemisms like that and glossing over it and trying it, it really minimizes the struggle that many people have and i want to i want to really emphasize that i guess my thought is like there is power in the ability to be authentic even with faults and that's maybe the piece that i'm most grateful for not pretending like everything's okay that's so interesting also i <laughs> The face I made when you said that, I was it was a face of agreement. So like I don't know, people can't see that because they <laughs> they're hearing us, right? But you're right. You're right. You know, I don't feel that either. I don't feel that like I think integrating all of the parts of me and figuring out how I can be the best version of myself with all of those parts acknowledged. Mm -hmm. That's where I feel power. But I don't feel like the neurodivergence of me itself is a superpower. What are you hopeful for as we go forward? What would make you feel grateful in five years or 10 years? Wow. 
You know, it's such an interesting question. I think I would be so grateful if we don't have to have conversations like this on a regular basis. I mean, I would love to have a conversation with you anytime, Emily, (laughs) but I don't want to have, I want, I'm looking forward to a time where it's just such a part of the fabric of our society that we don't have to have conversations about why we're thankful to be part of a neurodiversity movement, to be neurodivergent, to To be activists. Right. As an advocate, one of the things I often say is my job is to put myself out of a job. Mm -hmm. And I think I would be really grateful if that were similar in this space. Mm -hmm. And I think I would be really grateful if my kids can continue to show up in the world as themselves and not have to explain why. Mm -hmm. And that's the future I, I hope for. How about you? I will always remember being on a panel about neurodiversity in the workplace, specifically. And one of the panelists said, if we live in a society where every time somebody needs an accommodation, they have to ask for it, something is broken. That's my thought, is like, how can we get to a place and recognize that the more options and accessibility we have, the better it is for everyone. The more opportunities we have for people to not misinterpret what others are saying, but just ask for clarification, to assume best intent when there's a misunderstanding, to presume competence, you know, as far as what people can do, all of those things ultimately are good not just for neurodivergent people, but for all people. The more we can integrate those and normalize those, the better it will be. Agreed. The onus of responsibility should not be on those of us who need accommodations, to ask for accommodations, and to prove that we need them, right? Mm -hmm. I think if we can change the conversation from accommodation to what's going to make us most productive, that applies to everybody. So Amanda, as we wrap up today, first of all, I'm really grateful for your time and your friendship. Is there anything else that you would like to uh, to throw in there that we didn't cover? I would say I am, this is going to sound so cheesy, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm incredibly grateful that there's an audience out there who keeps this going so that there are 200 episodes mm. that people are learning from and sharing. And what a privilege yeah. to know that it makes a difference in the world. And I'm, I mean, this is your podcast. I'm just here for the ride today, you know? Absolutely. A huge debt of gratitude to everybody who has downloaded an episode, shared an episode, told a friend about an episode, not only from like a selfish point of view, (laughs) like, yeah, sure, it's great for the podcast, but really what I mean is for helping to advance that goal and for helping to make the world a better place for everybody. Look at us being grateful. (laughs) Thank you for having me on today. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast.
This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.